We're very proud that the Computer History Museum's contribution to the Bay Area Science Festival could be this wonder dialogue on artificial intelligence, a dialogue led by Tim Olson, an old friend of mine from KQED, and featuring Dr. Eric Horvitz of Microsoft and Dr. Peter Norvig of Google. Now, it's not very often, as you know, that Google and Microsoft can get together in the same room without some violent act breaking out. Uh, but uh, they have very, uh, as they do very often, uh, they have very generously put aside whatever differences Google and Microsoft may have to come together in this session for the good of expanding our knowledge of science and the state of the art in uh, very, very high-powered computing. And that's the kind of peacemaking advancement of knowledge that we like here at the museum. One of our members described us as the Switzerland of Silicon Valley. And uh, I hope today's session is uh, one example. Tim Olson, who is the moderator, is going to introduce Eric and Peter more fully, but I'd just like to introduce you to Tim. Uh, we've been friends for many years now. Tim was one of the early evangelists uh, in public broadcasting when we were both there for the future and the importance of public media on the internet and in digital media in general. He now pursues that passion at KQED in San Francisco. Uh, where he's the vice president and, as I like to think of it, the sort of chief digital guru for all of the work that K2, KQED is pioneering in mobile content on the web and, most of all, in digital education. This is Tim's first time to appear on our stage as moderator, so be easy on him. I know he's going to do a great job. We're delighted to have him here today. Please join me in welcoming Tim and Eric and Peter for this Wonder Dialogue. I'm thrilled to be up here on stage with these uh, two fine distinguished gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Eric Horvitz is the distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. Um, he is the immediate past president of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, a fellow at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, recently inducted to the Academy, American Academy for Arts and Sciences. Uh, just back from serving with the NSF, that's the National Science Foundation, where he's an advisory board uh, member. He's got a PhD in AI from Stanford, as well as an MD from Stanford, which is interesting in this field. Um, and he and his team uh, helped at Microsoft help create some of the world's first spam filters, of which we are all very grateful. Uh, Dr. Peter Norvig, as uh, director of research at Google, uh, he is a fellow at the American Association for Artificial Intelligence, uh, also a fellow at the Association for Computing Machinery, former head of computer science division at NASA Ames, right down the street, uh, where it, that was the uh, NASA's senior computer scientist. Uh, he's uh, one of the authors of Artificial Intelligence, A Modern Approach, which is considered to be uh, the leading textbook in the field, and about that thick, if you haven't looked. <laughs> Uh, his PhD is at computer science at UC Berkeley, so not, over, not only are uh, Google and Microsoft on the same stage, we have Berkeley and Stanford. It is indeed Switzerland here today. Uh, and if you search in Google for uh, PowerPoint, uh, you will find uh, Peter's uh, one world famous PowerPoint presentation on, among the results, and I'll leave that for the crowd for a little homework later. It's quite a fun little treat. Uh, so as John mentioned, uh, uh, we're Part, this uh, dialogue is part of a week of looking at science, and there's uh, science festivals all around the Bay Area. One of the things they're trying to do is try to inspire people into uh, careers in science and thinking more scientifically. Uh, you both have a long, distinguished resume. What, what, what got you into science in the first place? What uh, lit the spark, so to speak? So I, I've always been extremely curious about everything, uh, and I think um, uh, I was never told not to ask questions. Mm -hmm. And so you ask one question, it leads to another question. Um, I was particularly interested in how things work. Um, I remember asking my dad what God was made of. I was curious <laughs> about what was going on there. Uh, so you have to sort of be really just keep that thread going and, and um, uh, as parents really, um, I think, be supportive about uh, streams of questions that might lead to a, a whole new stream, each one of them. Yeah, I, I think I would echo that. Uh, so a lot of it is wanting to understand the world, make sense of things, have questions that have answers. And then also I think part of it is wanting to have an effect on the world, of yeah. saying, uh, you know, what can I do to contribute something that, that might actually help someone out there and seeing the capabilities of uh, being able to apply what you know theoretically 
to something practical in the world. Uh, yeah, it's a great theme. There's often a big disassociation between science out there in the quote unquote real world, but I think part of our talk today will address uh, how that's a big misconception. Um, you've uh, had a long career in science, uh, and particularly in artificial intelligence. Um, we're in the Computer History Museum. Are there uh, particular individuals that sort of helped you, guide you along the way, that uh, encouraged you to take one fork and not the other? You know, I'd say that for myself, um, the most important influences were books that I read that I happened to find outside of my normal coursework and so on. So I remember um, uh, reading um, pieces written by John von Neumann that were very influential in my thinking about what it, it was that I, I might do as I grew up. And um, uh, reading, um, of all people, a book by uh, Erwin Schrodinger, What is Life? Physicists writing mm -hmm. about life. And finally, what put me over the edge, I think, was one day I went to the bookstore for, to buy some books for my um, intended coursework, and I saw a stack of books on a, for another class, and one of them was uh, a book by Herbert Simon called The Sciences of the Artificial, which I highly recommend. It's a very small book and a fast read. And I was, you know, it, it, I just was enwrapped in this book, and I couldn't put it down, and I've worked on, been working on those ideas since. Uh, I guess for me, the, the, the earliest books were really more magazines, and I could say uh, Martin Gardner was a big influence on me, who wrote the Mathematical Games uh, column in Scientific American. And so, you know, every month there was something new there, uh, sort of a little problem that you felt like uh, I could actually work on something like that and right. make some progress, and, and that kind of got me into it. Uh, and then uh, I also felt uh, very welcome kind of into the academic community once I got there. So with my advisor, Bob Walensky, and then uh, other professors who would uh, uh, sort of treat me as if I was an actual person and say, yeah. maybe you can contribute to this field. So. Yeah, I have to say that um, you know, I, came, I came to St Stanford University as an MD, PhD in neurobiology. I had done a, a, an undergrad in biophysics, and I was more and more interested in, in mind, what was going on with, with the, the, the brain and mind connection. And my first swipe at this was I would go after the, the biology. That would be a, uh, a pathway to cognition. Um, and uh, at Stanford, um, um, like uh, Peter's comment, I ran into some very interesting uh, professors um, and started um, resonating with the thinking about the computational uh, dimension on, on thinking. Uh, and uh, it was that nurturing environment at Stanford where you know, people like Ed Feigenbaum, and Terry Winograd, uh, John McCarthy, I met John first actually, I went yeah. to see John McCarthy uh, and had a, had a chat with him. Um, I think they, they saw me as a promising uh, convert at the time and I ended up switching PhD programs actually. Wow. And we should mention John McCarthy was both a, a fellow here and uh, died just last month, so it's appropriate timing. Um, Peter, this is, this is about AI. Uh, there's a lot of lay people in the audience, including myself. Uh, how do you define AI for a uh, common person? I guess the way I think of it is uh, AI is the science of knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. And uh, in, in some sense, that's, uh, you know, all of computer science is about solving problems, uh, instructing a computer how to do something. Uh, but often, that's for something that you do know how to do, right? So uh, balancing your checkbook, uh, you know what to do. You add up these things, you subtract these things, there's a, an answer that you know. And AI is, is when you don't know. And, wh and why might you not know? Uh, well, there, you may not be able to observe everything. So uh, if you have to drive a car, uh, you have a certain number of cameras and other sensors, and you can see part of the world, but you can't see the other parts of the world. And yet, still, you have to take an action. Uh, you know, if you were writing the checkbook balancing program, you, you wouldn't think of, uh, well, what about all the checks that I don't know about? Those are out of bounds. But for AI, all of that is in bounds. And then, also, when you're driving the car, you don't know what's going to happen when you take an action. So if I say, hit the brakes, I don't know if I'm going to stop in 5 feet or 10 feet or 15 feet, depending on how wet it is. And yet still, the program has to know what to do, even though it doesn't know the outcome. There may be other things, like if you're uh, playing chess, 
You don't know what moves the opponent is going to do. So it's this reasoning with uncertainty and still being able to take the right action. That's what I define as AI. It's, it's interesting that there seems to be a growing interest in uh, AI. Uh, we have a big crowd here. Uh, in, you're, you're actually authoring a course at the moment that has mm -hmm. 140,000 students from uh, over 190 countries taking we're, intro to AI. Who we're, would have we're up to 200 countries now. So oh, there's a, wow. a, a couple countries in cent Central Africa that we've missed. But we was got was this a surprise? Did it just? Yeah, so we were very surprised. So, uh, you know, we've done this over the course of the last couple of years. I've been more interested in education and what we could do that's, uh, you know, so I've had this, the textbook for many years and felt that was kind of stale to have these uh, dead pages. And what can we do that's more interactive, uh, more exciting? And so uh, my co-teacher, Sebastian Thrun, and I uh, taught the class at Stanford, the intro AI class at Stanford last year with, a, with an aim of kind of moving it more online. And this year, we said, OK, we're going to make this leap to say not only we're we going to offer it to Stanford students, but simultaneously, we're going to offer a, a sort of sister class uh, to the whole world. And uh, we were excited to do that. And Sebastian, who's always very enthusiastic, said, we could get 10,000 people signed up. And I said, nah, Sebastian, you're crazy. We'll get a couple thousand for sure, but we won't hit 10,000. And then after uh, we sent out an email to uh, AAAI, and after uh, a week, we had 10,000 people. The next day, we had 20,000 people. And uh, we got up to 160,000 registered. So there's a lot of pent up interest in being able to take something like this. And, uh, and it's been great that people have been sticking with it. And uh, we've got, uh, as you mentioned, 140,000 people have, have at least seen some of the, uh, the video lessons over the last seven days. And 30,000 of them have uh, handed in uh, the three weeks of homework that we've had so far. So they're working hard. They're, uh, That's a lot of grading that you've been doing, yeah. <laughs> so, fortunately, we have computers to know, That's to know That's what to do. That's a good use of AI. That's right. When we don't so, know what to yeah, do. So, let's just make a comment that I, I, have, I think this is a really a great uh, uh, sign of deep, latent interest in machine intelligence. I think, um, uh, besides some of the uh, noteworthy uh, news items like Watson's success, uh, um, deep blue success a few years back. Um, the, the machine intelligence, the, the vision of, of, of artificial intelligence is a vision of, is a long-term vision on, on the, um, the opportunities for where computing is going and might go someday. It also, the work also has, as many people realize, deep implications for um, what it is that we are. Um, you know, what are our minds like? Um, using um, uh, tools and methods and ideas and theories about principles of intelligence to better understand human intelligence. I, I just get the sense that this, that's part of the latent interest and, and excitement about these concepts. Before you mentioned Herbert Simon and some of the early days of uh, artificial intelligence, and he said uh, in the early 60s, machines will be capable within 20 years of doing any work a man can do and obviously, things have, uh, didn't work out exactly as I expected, but, in, in, but also were different in ways they didn't predict. Uh, <laughs> comment a little bit about where we thought we'd be and where we are today. Let me first say that um, I have the deepest admiration for Herb Simon, uh, even if he wasn't the, uh, well, let's say even if he was uh, perhaps more optimistic than he, than he should have been at the time. But that said, uh, he and his colleague uh, uh, Alan Newell and students and other colleagues at the time um, had good reason to be optimistic. They made tremendous progress mm -hmm. uh, in the early 60s on systems like General Problem Solver. That was the first uh, time GPS was used as an acronym. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and um, uh, using logical methods to show how, which was, which was very exotic at the time, how a comp computing system, which was famous for numerical calculations and calculating trajectories of missiles, for example, could think with high-level symbols. So I could imagine why there was that kind of optimism at the time. Um, I think many uh, interesting um, challenges came to the fore with attempts to do some real open-world kinds of problem-solving. I'm using the phrase open-world to sort of refer to where Peter was, was going with his comments about what AI was. Um, we can get back 
more into, the, into that into, into a few minutes here, but in particular, one of the surprises about um, the challenges in AI was that it was easier to replicate expertise, wedges of brilliance like an expert um, pathologist, than it was to figure out how to give systems the abilities even children have about the common sense world. Um, gravity, containment of liquids in bottles, um, mm -hmm. all the things we know about social discourse. We turns out we have we know millions of facts, and we have a, we have intuitions about all sorts of things about reality. Um, if I ask this room like here, right, how many people here raise your hand if you thought about gravity gravity today? You know, we just don't even put that into our programs, and so it's really tough to imagine how deep the knowledge is we all have that's called common sense knowledge, and that's been a real big a big challenge point for for AI. And uh, you know, one of the things that's um, maybe ex exceeded their expectations is how much it's actually used in our daily lives today, and many of us may not sort of realize that. You think about spam filters, or you think about the latest operating system from Microsoft or others. These are actually under the hood AI, are they not? Yes, I think that's right. That, uh, AI touches uh, you every day, many times. Uh, so uh, you know, every time you do a credit card transaction, some computer has to decide, is that going to be approved or not? And, and that's done that way. You, you mentioned all these uh, uh, decisions made for recommendations. So, so a spam filter, is it in or out of your spam inbox? Uh, you go to uh, Netflix or you listen to some music, uh, what recommendations do you get next? Uh, what advertisements are, are shown to you? So sort of everywhere you go, uh, decisions are being made that affect you that are being made by AI systems. So, so one of the things, the big surprises um, probably couldn't have been predicted by Herb Simon and Marvin Minsky uh, and Don McCarthy uh, early on in the in late 50s and, and 60s was the, to what extent um, uh, large scale amounts of data would, uh, would, would serve as critical in some of the applications we're now seeing and theories of what it is to, to be an intelligent system. Um, the idea of um, even, I'm sure it was beyond people's expectations, that we'd be, even be able to collect so much data and have it around to analyze, and the, the deep role of machine learning, learning from data to predict uh, the future or to um, infer hidden states of the world that we can't see directly. Um, there were some beautiful papers written uh, in the 50s and 60s uh, about machine learning. Some are quite modern if you read them. Um, but the, the current trajectory we're on, at least in a, in a large branch of both of theoretical and practical um, applications of AI, um, is showing us that we can do quite a bit with data. I know Peter has quite a bit to say about that as well. Yeah, I think that's right, and we can get to data in a minute, but, but let me touch on one other thing that I think has changed since the 60s, is just the conception of, of what a computer is. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> yes, sure. you know, so then, with the predictions that Newell and Simon had to go on, they thought of the computers were these rare big things. And you know, there's a famous quote from an executive at IBM who said, uh, well, maybe there's a worldwide market for 10 computers. Right. Uh, right. And now, uh, you know, most of you probably have 10 computers with you. If you count your pockets <laughs> and go out to your car and count up the number of computers, you're going to exceed 10 each. Uh, so that really changed. And, uh, you know, even the visions of the future have changed. You look at like uh, 2001 and HAL is the iconic computer there, and HAL is the size of a room, and it's one big computer. And what we have now is many computers spread everywhere and communicating with each other. And so that com completely has changed uh, how we look at things. You know, if you walk, if you walk through the um, museum behind us, one thing that jumps out at visitors is the the amount of memory stored on these large drums that, for which there was so much excitement back in the, in the 70s and 80s, like, you know, 64K on this massive drum, for example. And we, I, I often thought over the years of, if I you just get a, a little graph by time of what the average person in our society, how much memory they're carrying on their bodies right now. You know, how many people are carrying less than a gig of memory on them right now in this room? <laughs> I mean, probably nobody. Uh, and, and, to, to, and for me to, for, for those words that I just uttered to a large audience, to have, if, if, that, if that was heard, just that phrase, 15 years ago, people would say, 
wow, where are things going, just from that phrase. The reason I'm mentioning this is because, and to resonate with, with Peter, um, just resources alone. Our current laptops are the supercomputers of 15 to 20 years ago. Um, and there's often a discussion about machine intelligence. We know that we're largely bottlenecked by our, our mathematical and creative powers to write better software, to understand how to solve problems, to understand how to perceive and to learn and reason. But you could say quite a bit has been taken care of by having much more horsepower, at least experimentally and even in real world systems, uh, both in terms of the, the, um, the, the speed at which we can compute and the amount of memory uh, we have both for collecting data and for real time manipulation of that data. One of those areas that they come together is machine translation. So uh, right now I could use my Chrome browser or pull up my mobile device and hit Google Translate and surf uh, the, the web in uh, 58 different languages. Uh, I noticed I was looking at Google stuff and you can translate into Yiddish, Welsh, Latvian, <laughs> Swahili, Hindi. Here we are in Silicon Valley. There's buildings of Google all around us, but I don't think that there's a building full of English to Swahili translators, nor the other way around. So how is AI sort of under the hood figuring out with the big data sets how to do this translation? That's right. So the, the field of uh, translation has changed, uh, uh, automatic translation. And uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the way you did it was by trying to hire these experts. You'd go out and you'd get linguists and you'd ask them, write down the vocabulary, what word means what word, write down the grammar rules, what's the grammar in English, what's the grammar in Welsh or whatever, and then somehow figure out how to translate between them. Uh, and that was a lot of work. And then when you were done, you had one language pair. We have 58 times 58 uh, language pairs. That's quite a bit right. more. Uh, so you couldn't reasonably do that in the old fashioned way. So what we do instead is say, well, let's just learn from examples. So let's go out and gather an example of here's a sentence in English and here's a sentence in Welsh. And now if somebody asks me exactly that same sentence, then I'm done. All I have to do is look it up. I've seen it before and I give you that sentence back. Now, of course, that's not going to happen very much. Instead, what's going to happen is you're going to ask a new sentence that I've never seen before, but I've probably seen some of the phrases before. And I can say, here's a three-word phrase that you're asking me for. Have I seen that before, and what does it line up with? Now, how do you figure out what it lines up with? Uh, well, uh, I guess you, you can see an example of that. If you go to my course, and there's a <laughs> uh, short video, and in three minutes, I can show you how to do that. And the, the example I use is a Chinese menu. And on the left-hand side, there's Chinese characters. And on the right-hand side, there's English phrases. And each line is a separate translation. And I don't know what any of the characters mean. But I can say, hey, you know, on the right-hand side, here's uh, 10 English phrases in a row that have the word soup in it. And on the left-hand side, oh, here's uh, 10 Chinese sets of characters. And they all have this one character in common. Maybe that character means soup. And then you cross that off, and then you say, uh, well, how about the word chicken? Chicken's on the right, appears in these places. On the left, it appears as these Chinese characters. Probably this Chinese character means chicken. And that's basically what we do. It's like doing a jigsaw puzzle. You figure out one piece, this word corresponds to this word, and then there's only so many pieces left over, and you keep doing that until all the pieces fit together. And now you've got this vocabulary. You know, this word or this phrase corresponds to this other one. Now, uh, in the old days, as, as we've talked about, we thought of AI as being a logical system. And you'd have to say, what's the translation? Is it right or wrong? Now we tend to think of it in terms of probability. So we don't say there's just one translation. We say, for this word, 80% uh, of the time it meant this, 10% of the time it meant something else, 5% of the time it meant something else, and so we have lots of possibilities. And then the process of translation is there's this offline step of learning what words correspond to what words in a probabilistic way. And then when I get a new sentence that I want to translate, I just go through, look up the probabilities, and then there's a clever way of deciding how to maximize the probability, and I pit, spit that sentence out, and I'm done. And all I've had to do was gather up these examples. Right? In this case, I had to go around to a bunch of Chinese restaurants and pick up some menus. <laughs> uh, and then I could build a machine translation system. 
And that system didn't care that it was in Chinese. So we've built systems where we have nobody on the team that speaks the language, and yet we're still able to build a translation system. The, um, it, it, for machine translation, some of the early boons to that research were finding generally aligned uh, large uh, bodies, or as they're called, corpora of text. Um, you heard a small example of the menus, but for example, a, a classic training set was the Canadian parliamentary proceedings, which had to be in French and English. Right. It became a really, uh, really great uh, uh, source of learnings. Um, an interesting aspect of, of machine translation, which also is leaking into other fields and is an is a interesting challenge problem in, in itself for, for theory and practice, is this whole notion of transfer learning. So the idea, not just among languages, but how do I learn something about, about um, some particular aspect of the world and then take that learning and apply it to some, some other uh, portion of the world I haven't trained and tested on before. Um, and this, this idea of whether it be going between mapping to new languages or new problems, it starts pushing up against this notion, again, that Peter mentioned earlier, um, of intelligence in the open world, where you're faced with new challenges and new problems, uh, new problem instances over time, and want to use techniques, methods, and knowledge, and maybe intuition and wisdom, even, in some of our systems, we like to say that reason under uncertainty, to make it through the world and, and be successful. Uh, we were talking in the green room, and one uh, very uncertain world is the ER room. You wear, <laughs> you wear an MD hat as well. Yeah. And you've been working on uh, predictive models in the ER room of all places. Yeah, so um, um, at Stanford, I, I was uh, very much um, focused on my, my computer science work, but also had an MD going. And I started actually uh, you know, getting really excited about applications of you know, computer science in, in healthcare uh, for a number of of challenge problems, planning, diagnosis, triage, um, uh, uh, understanding uh, the foundations, the causal foundations of, of illness. Um, uh, my dissertation itself was on time critical decision making for a bounded rational computer helping uh, a, a trauma care situation. So um, we were just talking in the green room again. I, I was just to, back in Washington, D.C. on Thursday. Uh, last week, uh, spending time in a large urban emergency department where we have a project going with collaborators, um, one of which is, is to, uh, which I think is a very interesting one, is to figure out when a patient who's just discharged from the emergency department will likely bounce back to the hospital within a few hours, often as the standard is three day bounce back, and be admitted to the hospital with a serious illness. Uh, and we have built from large amounts of data, over 10 years of data from that hospital, predictive models that predict quite well these probabilities. Um, one, uh, we, we were, we were, I was uh, sort of uh, reflecting that one uh, challenge is to have doctors actually use these systems, because doctors are very confident in what they do typically. And so we built a very special model for overconfident or maybe just regular <laughs> confident doctors, which predicts that the patient that they're discharging right now will bounce back to the hospital and be admitted with a serious illness within a few hours with a diagnosis that's nowhere on the chart currently. And would they mind looking? Would they want to look at it and see what the computer has to say about that? And so that kind of a model, a predictive model, gets uh, physicians thinking out of the box a bit and uh, as the computer aids them with understanding and interpreting many years of data that goes beyond what a single person could understand, even with training and experience. Another uh, area of massive data that both Microsoft and Google are working on is uh, traffic. And you know, it's pretty amazing now. You can open up uh, Bing or Google, and all of a sudden, you know that uh, this, there's a trouble area ahead and could potentially reroute. Uh, there's AI going under the hood here, I'm imagining. So I, I can mention a little bit about work uh, my team has done in that space. We, you know, um, I thought Bay Area traffic was bad, but if any of you have come to Seattle at rush hour, you'll understand what happens when you have a very caring community that, that, that fights expansion. Meanwhile, everything expands except the, the road infrastructure. And so it's like hardened arteries that, uh, that don't really respond well to pressure. Uh, and uh, so in Seattle, I personally got excited about understanding traffic better. Um, and um, one of our projects was called Clearflow, it was codenamed Clearflow, where we basically collected about um, uh, six years of data 
we just gave out at the time before GPS devices were, 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 were um, prevalent in, in cell phones, we gave out devices to Microsoft folks and their spouses and just collected data on flows of traffic around the region. Um, this grew into a system, I used to call this uh, our Manhattan Project in machine learning. Um, our PR folks said call it your moonshot. Okay, so <laughs> nice. Our moonshot in, in machine learning to basically um, predict every road speed uh, in a greater city area. Not just, not just roads that are being sensed, like highway systems like in the Bay Area or Seattle, other major cities, but every single road. So do transfer learning. Generalize what you know about roads to road properties and topology. And this ended up being, uh, evolving into a product effort that's now um, how you get um, traffic sensitive uh, directions and traffic sensitive predictions on Bing Maps and on the uh, Windows mobile phone. I hate to sound like an advertisement here, especially with the <laughs> <laughs> Works on Google. Yeah. <laughs> but it's been a, a really exciting project because it, it basically says now that you don't have your naive GPS device that says traffic sensitive take you off 101 uh, and onto a side street when 101 is blocked because it, it, it just assumes that the side streets are just fine in those situations. It turns out that it can be worse. So we want to reason it holistically about a whole city uh, and uh, that was very exciting for us to, to, to do with machine learning. I should say, in, in addition to the machine learning problem of uh, understanding the data and how it's changing over time, there's also the static problem of how do you get quickly from one location to another? You know, how do, how do you plan a route from here to New York? There's uh, millions of steps along the way. I see we have in the audience Peter Hart, one of the uh, originator uh, of the earliest where's, where's, algorithms where's to, do, uh, oh, to do route correct. planning. Oh. And so so that's, uh, you know, no longer considered an AI problem because it's so well solved now, yeah. but it has its roots in, in AI technology. I say, um, uh, Peter, it was just, just incredible contributions uh, in the area of decision making under uncertainty, inference. Um, and uh, I think, uh, you know, the A-star algorithm is really, is, is quite, plays quite a central role in, thick, is in, in thinking style and how we solve large problems. Um, as a reflection, some of the, the directions we're going in in machine intelligence are tools along the lines of how do I uh, face a massive search space uh, or a ma so massive complexity in a tractable way that, where I can make some sense um, with methods that might, might be not exponential but polynomial time um, that don't grow as fast as the, as, as the size of the space. And we're seeing some magic showing up in this realm in computer science and in, 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 in AI research, including ways to do simulation or sampling of spaces where you can start understanding the space by probing it with little spotlights. Um, and just to, only to give you a sense of the science now, the idea is, um, uh, is the world such that even in complex places we can sample uh, and make sense of the larger whole without ever seeing the larger whole? Peter, be before Google, you were at NASA. And uh, if you take one of these AI systems, put them in a box, and add some robotic arms and some sensors, all of a sudden you have a interplanetary probe. Uh, talk a little bit about robotics and how adding uh, interactions with the world and these AI systems is evolving. Right, so, so I think that's another, robotics another area where there is all this un uncertainty. Uh, so we were able to do some work, I was down the street uh, from here at NASA Ames, and we were working with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory on the control for the rovers. And we had a, a mission on our own, where we, uh, the Deep Space One mission, where we actually had an AI planning system on board. It was the first time uh, that had been done. Normally, spacecraft are controlled from the ground, and, and every single step of what the spacecraft done is uh, radioed up to it. Uh, we did that on board, and then we inserted a, a fault into the system, and the AI system planned around that and recovered. So that was demonstrated, and we thought from there, well, now it's a simple step. We'll, uh, you know, we'll immediately put that in all the rovers and they'll take off from, from then on. Uh, turned out it wasn't that simple because the mission controllers are uh, deservedly very conservative. Right? And they all said, well, we love new technology and we'll, we'll use any new technology that's been proven on three previous missions. <laughs> so you can see there's a little bit of a, a chicken and egg there. Yeah. <laughs> and so rather than saying, uh, yeah, you know, 
your system worked once okay on a technology mission, now I'll just adopt it, uh, they were more conservative. And so what we ended up doing was taking our automatic control systems and putting most of the functionality on the ground rather than on Mars. And so what we could do then is give to the scientists and engineers a system where they could do what-if scenarios. And previously, uh, you know, Mars rovers work on a, on a daily cycle. Uh, Mars day is, is uh, about an hour longer than the Earth day. But uh, since they're solar powered, uh, they sleep at night and the people on the ground plan what it's going to do the next day and then they send up the mission and they operate for a day and, and you keep repeating that cycle. And what we enabled the planners on the ground to do was to be more experimental. If the, the hours that they had to plan the mission, they didn't have to spend the whole time saying, is this going to work? Is this something that the rover can execute? They were able to say, well, what if? And then in a few seconds, rather than a few hours, our system could say, yes, the rover can do that, or no, the rover can't do that. So it was still a human in the loop who was making the final uh, checkoff to say, yes, we can do this. Uh, but we were enabling them to do more. And now, uh, as the missions progress, we had a, a very successful mission, a uh, long-lasting mission on Mars, and now there's another one on the way. Uh, I think they're landing in August. And uh, each time, there's been more and more autonomy on board uh, rather than on the ground. So, so Peter just mentioned uh, human factors and people in the loop. And um, I'll just mention that um, we both share an interest in space. I was a, a, a Stanford a graduate um, um, I was under a graduate student research fellowship from NASA, and so I would spend time at NASA Ames and so on. One project we did back then um, that actually ended up being fielded at the Johnson Space Center in the Mission Control Center, uh, the MCC as they called it, um, was a project that looked at um, applications of machine intelligence to um, uh, work better with people in the human factor space. And the idea was um, we built a system that could reason about space shuttle um, propulsion systems, all the faults that might be going on from all the streaming telemetry, but to trade off the complexity of what was being shown to the potentially overwhelmed propulsion um, engineers at the console in the Mission Control Center by computing dynamically a measure we called the expected value of revealed information. And it turned out we didn't have to overwhelm people with a bunch of data like you see on those flickering screens. We could reason about the trade-off between more information and the value of less information um, where we remove the cost or reason about the cost of more information that might be overwhelming. Um, and that system went online and it was, on, it was online until the last um, shuttle mission, I believe. You're talking about human and AI or human cons computer system interactions and uh, we're familiar with uh, voice systems in mm -hmm. banks and uh, Siri now out of uh, Apple. And, uh, but here we are on the stage and um, I can raise my eyebrows, I can gesture, we can smile or frown. Uh, you know, we're, we're communicating long before we're talking. How is AI sort of and robotics trying to figure that out? Well, I have to say that uh, um, you're, you're touching on a, on a topic that's central on my team now at Microsoft Research. If you went to my webpage, you'll see about five or six of my recent papers with colleagues is about the topic of, of how do we bring together multiple components of developed in the AI field and push on, on weaving them together to build a system that could have a conversation of the sort that Peter, uh, Tim and I are having right now um, with all the nonverbal gestures, uh, notions of gaze, uh, engagement, um, even understanding when it is someone else is going to finish talking uh, so that you don't overlap and so on, even with the, how to interpret the, of course, the, the, the words into, into meaning as well. So um, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the grand challenges. Again, when we sit in a living room, this is kind of a living room like environment right now, um, it's, it's hard to understand how deep the, re the intelligence requirements are to have a fluid conversation. Yet we do this in such a natural way, we don't, we don't reason about the computational foundations of what it might take. Um, that's the kind of reason I think think that Herb Simon was not thinking about when he said we'd expect to be doing some of the work of human beings very shortly um, at the, in the 1960s. It's a, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a grand challenge and it often takes what we call integrative AI, as I mentioned, bringing together perception, learning, uh, decision making, vision, uh, and um, um, I often like to say that on these projects, 
um, one thing we're pursuing is not just the assembly of the, or the um, copy, you know, sort of copying together of, uh, of, of multiple pieces, um, but uh, uh, new principles of integration of these components where the whole might be much greater than the sum of the parts. We understand something about the integration of these pieces of intelligence that uh, underlie these kinds of rich behaviors um, that are so fluid for people. So, so I think we always want our computers to be able to understand us better, to uh, see not just what our, uh, the words are that we say, but the intonation in our words and our body language and so on. That's always good. I think sometimes we want uh, computers to be able to mimic that behavior, but sometimes we want something completely different. And uh, you know, to just try to say, well, let's have a computer that has a face, whether it's a robot or an animated face, uh, often that doesn't work. And that's not what you want. And there's this notion of the uncanny valley, meaning if you get a robot that's almost like a person but not quite, it's really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if you get it so it doesn't look like a person at all, that's often much better. Mm -hmm. And so you want to figure out how to build something. Uh, we also know there are cases, uh, so another problem is uh, the person you interact with has to have a model of how the computer works, what can it do and what can it not do. And if it looks like a person, then you want it to act like a person. And if it doesn't, then you're upset. If it looks like a, a, a dumb computer in some way, it's easier to get a model of what it, where its limitations are. So that's part of it. And also of, of what your social interaction should be. So, you know, I've been working on this, this education stuff. And uh, one of the things uh, uh, Salman Khan pointed out to me is if you're a human tutor talking to a person one-on-one, -on -one, which is about the best method we know for revealing knowledge, uh, if after the tutor explains something three or four times and the student isn't getting it, the student tends to say, oh yeah, okay, now I got it, because he's embarrassed to uh, keep being ignorant in front of the tutor. But if you do that in front of a computer and the computer presents itself not as a human, but as a, a, you know, a, a machine, uh, then the student is perfectly willing to rewind the video or replay it five or 10 or 15 times, whatever it takes. And he doesn't feel like, oh, I have to prove to this uh, computer that I've uh, learned it and we can move on. So uh, sometimes you don't want to imitate humans. You know, in, the, uh, in this realm of, um, of human computer interaction, there's a, a notion um, called complementary computing, where someday um, uh, a, AI systems will augment our abilities in a very fluid way with a mix of initiatives. So imagine there's a problem sitting in front of a human being, and an intelligence is working with you, a, a machine intelligent uh, assistant, collaborator, and it looks at that problem and it understands the parts that, that how to break it up into pieces such that the parts that you'd best handle, the human being, are over here, and the parts that I, the machine, can handle are over here, and we're gonna communicate that very quickly with, a, with some sort of a language, and work together in a very collaborative way. Um, there are s simple examples of that now, but I, I see that as one big direction for machine intelligence is as general augmentation with communication and understanding as to who does what at any moment. You say the word uh, human intelligence, and. Uh, there's about 100 billion neurons in the brain. And you know, with Moore's law and processing power, we're, we're getting more and more connections all the time. Uh, is, there, is there a point out there where there's the same amount of computation cycles happening as in the human brain? And if so, does something happen? Uh, I don't think you can count like that. So the, <laughs> the uh, human brain is doing very different things than what computers do. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly, you know, we talked about 20 years ago what a big difference there was, and it was clear then that there was a huge gap. Uh, and you couldn't expect computers uh, with uh, kilobytes rather than gigabytes to be able to perform anything like the brain. Uh, but now, depending on what you count, there are places where we have seemed to have equaled or surpassed them. So if you look at, uh, you know, uh, all the computers that are connected to the Internet, uh, by almost any measure you can make, uh, they're more powerful than the brain. Yet somehow, they haven't all come together right. and, do, and done what the brain does. So I think it's, in that case, it's more of a software issue than a hardware issue. So, so one of the reasons I, I actually, after finishing my PhD, I went back and finished medical school was I had this dream that someday I would, um, th th that neurobiology and computer science would both advance and 
start coming together in, in, in ways at the level of understanding of cognition, such that the MD might help me to easily re-enter the NIH with a white lab coat on with my electrodes, and I could get back into the wet side and really understand what's <laughs> going on in the brain. Um, I still think we're quite a ways from that, but that said, I believe deeply that the principles of intelligence, perception, learning, reasoning, planning, uh, open world uh, uh, problem solving, that underlie the way you feel at this moment, the, the buzz of existence, the sense of self, being here, solving problems, being human, those principles uh, will be explained by advances in computation. That what you're feeling now is computation, that we are computational, and the brain is doing a pretty good job of it. We probably could do better uh, as we learn the aerodynamics of intelligence uh, that belie both, both the artifacts we're creating as well as uh, the human mind. What do you mean by the aerodynamics of intelligence? Well, there's a sense that some people, well, there are different um, intuitions about what we might discover in the limit with pursuing computational uh, um, explanations for uh, intelligence uh, and, and the human mind. Um, and uh, one perspective is that there will be some fairly uh, unified and deep theories that we just don't understand yet uh, about um, what it is that allow an agent to be intelligent. Um, another perspective, uh, which I <coughs> might call the, um, for now I'll just call it the Marvin Minsky School. People here in the audience might be familiar with Marvin Minsky's ideas. He had the notion that what was going on in, in, in people and, in, and should be a direction for research would be a society of minds, kind of an ad hoc uh, um, community of problem-solving agents that get together and figure out how to coordinate in kind of a scruffy way, and basically that would, that's what really bright things were, um, and there wasn't some grand unified theory of intelligence. Um, when I use the phrase aerodynamics, get back to your question, I was maybe uh, in a hopeful way with a little glimmer of optimism, suggesting that there might be deeper uh, theories and models, uh, even, even if disparate and separate, they might explain how you can put things together in a way that would be, be more, have a theoretical foundation. You're both head of uh, some of the, the great research institutions uh, in computer science. How, how is, what are the big problems that you're working on? What, and how do they apply to sort of applied sciences? So uh, some of the big problems that are being worked on now in my lab and, and, and Peter's labs and other, other uh, groups at, at universities include um, causality. Uh, how can we take data and reason about causality in a way that a deep scientist might probe causality? Um, a is not just associated with B, but A is causing B. How can we learn that automatically? Or to see A and B that you thought were related and where A looked like it was causing B, but there's a variable, hidden variable C, that's causing both. Um, we're now developing models and, and theories for doing that automated science, which is a very big grand challenge area, which will have very big implications for our civilization. And I'm very optimistic that, that most, if not all, great discoveries, astounding discoveries will be either by computing systems or with the deep assistance of computing systems over the next several decades and, and beyond. Uh, another big area for us is, I mentioned before, transfer learning, but we use this notion of open world intelligence to really hit hard on this idea that Peter mentioned right at the outset of, the, of, of, of our session. Um, what are some principles by which a system can look out um, and, and understand um, that its mind, its abilities and competencies are um, not deep enough and broad enough for the complexity of the environment that it's immersed in and understand explicitly that it needs to learn and be on a gradient all the time and to perform what we call lifelong learning. And we have some papers and some technologies on that front right now, but it's, it's slow going and, challenge, and a big challenge. So those are all good ones. Uh, let, let me throw out another one, which is the object recognition problem. So given mm -hmm. a uh, picture or a video, what are all the things in it? Now, we've solved special cases of that, 
So you can buy a, a $100 camera now and it'll put a little green rectangle around all the faces. Uh, but we've done that by very carefully analyzing what a faces look like and building in that one solution. Now we'd like to do it for, for every possible object. To take, take any video and say, what are all the things in it? Now, if you take a YouTube video, usually the answer is kittens. Uh, so, That's a universal. So we should be really good at that, right? Because we have a lot of data to learn from. We've got these millions of videos, and they've got a caption or a keyword that says cute kittens. And so we should be able to, just as we did machine translation, we should be able to go in and say, well, what's a kitten? Well, that's a little blob that looks like this in one frame, and the next frame it looks like this, and here's all the possible ways it looks. And then once we've gotten that, now we can address the other things in the image. So you subtract out the kitten, and you'd say, uh, well, this is a scratching post, and this is a floor, and this is a wall, and this is a sky, and start to put together a catalog of everything in the world. Let's look ahead a little bit. So in 10 years, 50 years, um, uh, how far are we away from human intelligence? Just take a gamble. Just to... Well, first of all, I, I object to that, because I, I think that's a, a, a low target to aim at. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Right? Because certainly there's lots of things already that computers are much, much better at people at, right? If, if I want to take the uh, squares of the cosines of a long stream of numbers, uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to aim at human level performance, right? Awesome. So there's many things we can do better. If, if I want to memorize uh, all the pages on the internet and choose one that best matches some keywords, I don't want human level performance for that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's things we can do better, and there's things we, we can do worse. And uh, I don't want to duplicate a human. I, I mean, I, I know how to duplicate a human. I have two of them. And uh, <laughs> uh, they're in high school, and, and they're doing great. Uh, so we don't need more of those. But what we need is uh, a better partnership. We want to be able to say, what is it that humans can't do that, that computers can do better? Now, Part of that may be that the computers want to have some basic competency at the human level in order to interact with us better. Uh, but the goal shouldn't be human level performance. The goal should be a superhuman partnership. Uh, you, you've mentioned like uh, if, if our grandkids are going to the airports or uh, having um, going to a doctor's office, what might their experience be different? Or what might they take, it for, take for granted as we take yeah. mobile devices? I think Tim is, Tim is following on a, a discussion we were having. So I was describing uh, that by my door at Microsoft Research, we've had several years now, it's, it's one of our uh, um, focal projects um, to build an assistant that's uh, a, a, an admin with, comp with competencies that a human being would have. Um, and the, um, the reaction we get from people walking to my door is, is one of, people, people are astounded sometimes when it knows their name and it, it, it makes eye contact, it, it talks with them about where I might be, it, it, it goes across the, the network and figures out how long it'll take me to get there, why I'm late and with an apology and should they get me a message. Um, so we're starting to see services that are actually breaking through this uncanny valley um, that are um, working in a very complimentary way with people. Uh, and with groups of people, which is another interesting challenge, multi-party we call it, um, such that I suggested that our grandkids, maybe great-grandkids, won't find it out of the ordinary to walk into an airport and have a system um, uh, that, behind, you know, sort of on, on a video screen that's kind of like a person that, that checks in, that says, uh, oh, and is Zachary, is that, is that your son? Is, 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 and he's with you, right? And, that bag's a little bit big for the compartment, I think, over there, and really it starts to do things we often would have a sense that people would be required to do. Um, and there are many things like that um, uh, that we can make as challenge problems, typically of integrative AI, uh, and start, start pushing on. But I do agree with Peter that um, this idea of complementary computing with mixes of initiatives really uh, has, has great promise for uh, extending and expanding our abilities to, to achieve goals in the world. Uh, so we'll start pulling some great questions from the audience here. Uh, Peter, how close are we from uh, unmanned cars, uh, Google or otherwise? <laughs> uh, I, th there's a mix there of a technology problem and a sort of societal problem of, uh, our, so can, what can the cars handle and what can society handle? And, uh, 
So the cars are doing pretty well now. We, we've driven uh, 100,000, 200,000 miles or so uh, without a problem. And occasionally, we have to shift control back uh, to the person in the driver's seat. But most of the time, they're under complete autonomous control. Uh, so they're doing great. I think they're, they're probably right now uh, about at the level of human drivers, which again is, is not that high a, a barrier. <laughs> right? So about a, about a million people a year worldwide are uh, killed in, in car accidents. So if, but the problem is if we cut that in half, we wouldn't get half a million thank you letters, we'd get half a million lawsuits from the, <laughs> right. from the other right. side. And so we've right. got to figure out as a society, uh, how do we want to deal with this? Uh, what can the cars do and not do? And then, uh, and we also have to figure, make the machines better, uh, make it cheaper. So right now we, we have these cars, but they have extremely expensive uh, uh, sensing devices on them, uh, uh, LIDARs and radars and so on. So you've got to get that cost down. Um, and then you, we also got to figure out some way to deal with the user interface. So right now, you know, we're driving the cars, it's under complete automated control, but there's one guy sitting at the wheel ready to take over at any second, and there's another guy in the passenger seat monitoring the computer to see if it's doing the right thing, and if anything goes wrong, they immediately uh, spring into action. And you know, if you sell this as a commercial product, uh, uh, the driver is not going to be sitting there alert. He's going to be <laughs> sleeping or reading his email or whatever. And if a red light flashes, uh, how is he going to take over quickly? We, we haven't quite solved that problem yet. Yeah, I have to say that as, as someone who lost his mother to a car accident during my grad school days and a few weeks back, some, some very close family, uh, actually a whole family, uh, when, 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 uh, Palo Alto family uh, that was killed in a, in a tragic accident while on a camping trip. I have to say that AI has deep implications for, for reducing collisions, even well in advance of completely autonomous driving. Um, we should not be tolerating um, these number of lives lost to transportation far more than our wars uh, that, that, that really occupy our minds. Um, and. Um, 35,000 last year fatalities in the U.S., many more uh, um, uh, terrible injuries, uh, and then, then, of course, the worldwide problem. So I think we, we can do a lot there, and I expect, I expect a great deal there from our community. Yeah. Uh, and I should say, you know, you're already starting to see it, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Eric said uh, 35,000. A few years ago, it was 40,000, and I think that's uh, mostly due to uh, the stability control which is uh, you know, more thought of as control theory rather than AI, but it's really a sister technology to AI. Uh, what science fiction depiction of AI do you think uh, hit closest to the truth, or might turn out to? Uh, I like uh, Rainbow's End by uh, Werner Vinge, which is a story set in the near future, maybe uh, 20 or 30 years from now. I don't think he says exactly. And the idea is that uh, Everybody is wired into the internet at all time. They've got these glasses with a heads-up display, and they're communicating everywhere. And, the, uh, and their intelligence or the ability to deal with things is, is advanced because of that. And the, you know, the average high school assignment is uh, build an international corporation with partners around the world and construct a, a new product. And high school students routinely do that. And then the book focuses on a, uh, a character who was a Nobel Prize winning poet who had Alzheimer's, so he was asleep for 20 years and they can do the Rip Van Winkle mm -hmm. thing. And then he wakes up and has to go back to high school and learn to use these uh, devices to kind of augment uh, his intelligence and catch up with the rest of the world. So I'll just say that I think that the evolution of machine intelligence uh, it will be such that there'll be a lot of surprises there that haven't been captured yet in science fiction. Hmm. Uh, what's, uh, Eric, maybe this is for you, uh, what's the state of art, state of the art using AI in the medical field, uh, particularly around diagnostic systems? So, machine intelligence has made, uh, has had great successes with diagnosis. Um, uh, even during my graduate school days, we already had systems uh, part that I was collaborating on, that we, we could show did, did at the level, if not better, than expert diagnosticians. 
The challenge is one of translation, as it's called, translational medicine. How do you take the successes in the AI labs behind the walls of the laboratory and really get them fielded uh, where they're going to make a difference? Um, believe it or not, um, after all this work with diagnosis, many physicians would tell us, well, we don't really have trouble with diagnosis. We want to do chronic disease management. And so there were, there's, there's, a, there's kind of a, a sen uncertainty as to where the, uh, the intelligent reasoning systems would have the most impact in healthcare. Um, but I think my sense is that um, um, with data in particular, we can really build systems today at the level of the best expert diagnosticians in, in clinical healthcare. We have a teacher who asks, uh, what were you both doing in your spare time when you were in high school? <laughs> Did you have any spare time when you were in high school? Uh, playing basketball? <laughs> Not building robots yeah. or anything. Yeah. Ice hockey. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, I've always been sort of a, you know, gadgeteer, uh, building things. I, I actually tried to build a little electronic brain in third grade. It didn't have very much success. Still working on it. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, I think we're just I was a Normal traditional kids. kid, uh, uh, quite curious about many things. Um, I, I did know, I remember the moment where, uh, back, maybe to answer that question more broadly, I remember the moment when I decided that I was going to be focused on science the rest of my life, and it was during elementary school. I said, this, like, this, is, this is so incredible, this is where I'm going. And I remember having that direct um, reflection. Was it a teacher, a book, uh, uh, just a, just trying to figure out how the world works? Probably combinations of the three, but certainly teachers have had big impacts on me personally. Um, all my fabulous teachers uh, loom, loom very deeply in my mind at all times. And uh, Mrs. Frank in, you know, in second grade, uh, Mr. Wilmot in sixth grade, uh, mm -hmm. and so on. I mean, these people live with me. Um, we're running out of time, but uh, are there certain processes that you believe uh, will always remain solely done by humans? Jokes, as an example, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, uh, you heard me say before that I, uh, that, I, that I believe deeply that humans are computational. Um, that suggests that... Um, all these things we call human are up for grabs for other computing systems. Um, I do think that people with their evolutionary path have certain nuances that make them very interesting and uh, fun uh, in, in a variety of ways. We have you know, interesting notions of aesthetics and so on uh, and uh, humor. Uh, I'll, touch, I'll mention that humor has been a topic of some AI um, dissertations in the field. Um, That's funny. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and people thought about, okay, what makes a good joke, what makes a good joke, what makes a good joke, <laughs> with knowledge bases and so on. Unfortunately, you often need a lot of common sense reasoning to make really good jokes, uh, but there are some ver verified notions of, of humor that could make a human being giggle uh, that have been out there. Uh, so um, um, I'll say yes, but I'm not exactly sure what Which just ones? yet. It's a, uh, Daniel Dennett has a new book on uh, jokes, which is in my uh, bathroom reading material. There. <laughs> and I have to say that the analytic study of jokes is entirely unfunny. Right? <laughs> right, so the, so that's, the, that's humorous. Yeah, that's right. So, so, the, so the book is, is uh, you know, interlaced with uh, a joke that's funny and then an analysis of it that would totally kill the joke. <laughs> uh, what might be the economic impact of AI on our economies? Can you, can you solve this recession thing? Yeah, so, so you see estimates are already, and I, I don't know, it's you know, somewhere in the billions or hundreds of billions or whatever, and different people make different counts because it's hard to know uh, where you cut off, well, how much of something is the AI and how much isn't. Uh, Pat Winston at MIT has this saying that the uh, AI in industry is like the raisins in raisin bread. That, uh, you know, most of the bread is just the dough, the, the uh, boring dough stuff, but the raisin is the little parts that make it yummy. Uh, and so you'll see that a lot, that uh, there's an application and, you know, most of the work that went into it was hard work by engineers who are not AI people, but then you add in a little bit of AI and, and it makes it more valuable. And how much do you count that towards the economic impact? It's hard to uh, assess the, the credit in that case. Uh, but there, as, as we said before, certainly everything 
that's going on in terms of running the modern world has some, some AI component in it. Yeah, if we can really pull off the dreams that I have, um, I foresee uh, that this whole period we're in right now will be viewed several hundred years from now as the, uh, the early days of uh, an age of intelligent machines um, with implications potentially deeper than the Industrial Revolution. So um, let me just say that I think it's going to be significant and far beyond what we view as you know, the gains that come from the, the information technology or IT community, which have been, which have been massive. Uh, what do you think are the top five problems in AI in this century, or maybe just one of the top challenges that we're trying to solve that's not yet been figured out? Uh, well, well, I guess you could answer that in two ways. So, so one in terms of the application areas, and so like I mentioned, the, the object recognition problem, mm -hmm. and then also in terms of the, the underlying technologies. Uh, so I think, yeah, and so let me answer the latter one. And I think there's a couple things that we don't quite do right yet. And uh, one of them is doing uh, hierarchical reasoning. So uh, we can do generalizations, and Eric talked about some of those. And if you have a, a data set, we can find the best generalization for that data set. And you know, you're used to doing that. If you see, even in your, your high school science experiment, you, know, you have some plots. There's x values and y values. And then you draw a straight line between them. <laughs> Uh, that's an AI system that's making a prediction, right? And so we can do that uh, with the raw data, but what we really want to be able to do is do that at multiple levels and say we observe the world and we make some prediction at that level and then we make some generalization at a higher level. This isn't just the little data points, but this is what's going to happen, you know, so you could go from driving a car from uh, what image do I see in front of the car th three feet ahead of it to uh, what road am I on to what route am I on on my way to New York? And you don't want to plan out your whole trip to New York at the level of inch by inch. You want to have a, a hierarchical system. And uh, we aren't very good at transferring from one level to the next. So I think uh, that's one. I'll let you take the next one. Well, I think uh, the, the phrase common sense reasoning is actually a, um, a, a topic because there are several subtopics there. But let me just say for now, uh, mastering uh, what we consider to be common sense reasoning um, is a very, is a big grand challenge in, in AI. Uh, if, if people want to do a little bit of reading, there's a fabulous piece of work by Patrick Hayes uh, from a couple decades ago called The Naive Physics Manifesto, where Patrick just said, he, he got back from the Piaget Institute, a study of kids, uh, a center for study of study of children's and minds as the in young people in Europe, France got back and said, I want to just write down the logic and the inference. You need to understand when a glass of milk falls over and spills onto a table. And to look at the, the challenges that that required to encode that representation and in, in the inference framework for a system to reason the way a kid might reason about a glass falling over and getting a cookie wet. Um, this is a, a, a big grand challenge. Another grand challenge which comes into the same, which intersects with that challenge is the open world learning problem. Uh, and I'll just, since we're, we're sitting in this room here together and getting close to the end of the session, I'll bring up a big elephant in the room. Uh, a deep challenge is understanding what on earth's going on with consciousness. This whole notion of sense of self, being, experience, qualia, subjective states, we really don't know what's going on there just yet, whether it's epiphenomenal, whether it's um, something special, it's an illusion uh, to machines that are this competent just happen to feel like I feel, for example. Uh, I think uh, we'll get some answers uh, along, those, along those lines uh, over the next few decades. Uh, how will we know? Will it be a Turing test type <laughs> of thing? Or, uh... Well, I, I should say that uh, I've never been a big fan of the Turing test. Uh, even though I, well, I deeply, deeply admire uh, um, Can you explain Alan Turing. It for those who don't know? Uh, people probably are quite familiar with the Turing test. Uh, Alan Turing wrote a piece, a treatise in 1950, um, uh, thinking about, well, how, how would you ever know if a system was as smart as a human being? And I think he punted when he said, well, the system will, um, if I spoke to the system through a teletype machine and through a human, I, I really can't tell the difference when I ask any question I want and listen to a response. So he's giving sort of a behavioral argument. He said the only way we'll be able to tell if something is as smart as a person is through a behavioral uh, set of probes and responses. 
Um, I've never really deeply been satisfied with that. Do you have a better one, Peter? What, what would be your test for uh, intelligence of the next level? I, I guess I'm going to punt, and, and I'm going to punt even harder than uh, <laughs> Turing did. Uh, you know, I'm going to have a 63 yarder or something. Uh, so uh, I like uh, the, the words of Edgar Dijkstra, who said, uh, the, the question of whether a computer can think is uh, about as reasonable as the question of whether a submarine can swim. And, and so I think what he meant by that was uh, that the answer to the question is really an answer about linguistics, and it's not about computers or about brains. And that uh, in English, we have this convention that most of you, we, we could do a show of hands, but most of you probably say, well, no, submarines don't swim, uh, but airplanes do fly. Uh, <laughs> But that doesn't mean that naval engineers think of things differently than aeronautical engineers do. That just means that's the way we chose to use those words. And, and in Russian, if you ask the equivalent of the word swim, uh, that does apply to, to submarines. Uh, but the Russian submarines aren't built different than the uh, English-speaking submarines. So, so for me, uh, you know, what really matters is uh, what you can do. And maybe, you know, I think uh, Eric mentioned consciousness, and I think that's a fascinating topic, but I just decided I'm not going to count that as my topic. My topic is uh, getting computers to do the right thing, and uh, philosophers and psychologists can worry about the other problems. Uh, there's a question about uh, sensors and, and motor movements. I mean, there's been uh, sort of a Moore's law of the, the miniaturization and the computational power in all the sensors that are around us every day. And you talked about data inputs before. And now, not only do we have the language of the web, but uh, hundreds and millions of images and uh, uh, barometric pressure, all these sort of sensors are out there. What does that mean for robotics and AI? I, I think the, the, um, the incredible availability of low-cost sensing uh, and the ability to network it and collect data right. from it that's come with the uh, march of computing more generally some of which is captured behind us in the, in the current exhibit at the, at, the, at the Museum of Computer History, um, is really fueling lots of innovation in terms of um, uh, topics of machine intelligence in what's called ubiquitous computing or pervasive computing. Um, new applications of sensing and optimization for, for example, making sure your vineyard is, is working at the optimal, in, is producing the right kind of grapes, for example. Uh, understanding uh, whether a driver is fatigued at any moment, needing help and assistance with driving, or maybe some more uh, aggressive automatic braking. Um, so there's a, a, an incredible um, uh, um, you know, world of, of innovation that's been stimulated by the, the availability of these sensors, typically network sensors. Yeah. So I think that's right. There, there's plenty of opportunity there from a, kind of a technical point of view. I think it's also interesting from a political point of view. Right? Mm -hmm. So we talked about science fiction, and you can talk about other icons of science fiction, like 1984, where we have this uh, specter of uh, government always watching you, the, the surveillance state. Uh, but now we have the possibility for what David Brin calls the, the surveillance state, where everybody can watch everything. And you're not, it's not only the government that has the, the capital to do that, but uh, sensors are cheap and you can watch the government watching you, and uh, the balance of power is re restored a little bit. In, you know, in a world where, at least, in, at least in the United States, where the government has some strict uh, uh, constitutional constraints on looking at people, um, the world now is turning to companies that have the ability legally to watch and perceive and to capture large amounts of longitudinal data about people over time. Um, it also brings up the notion, um, and this is a, a, you know, a very big interest of mine, the whole area of what machine intelligence and computer science more generally can do to help with privacy. We all, get, we all want services like recommendations that are fabulously tailored to our interests and preferences. Um, we might raise an eyebrow about the fact that to do that well, some, some companies often need to, or say they need to, monitor quite a bit of our interests and preferences and actions, for example, in interacting on the web. Um, so there's a trade-off there, and we can study that trade-off and actually maybe act in accordance if people have controls and understand what's going on with their preferences about that trade. Now, one concern that I have that goes a little deeper 
uh, in terms of control. And we, I think we, we kind of typically respect large companies because they really, besides being benevolent in many ways, uh, and they really can't afford to offend populations of people. Uh, so they, they're very careful in working uh, to make contracts and to work with people to describe what they're doing. But I'm concerned about renegade uh, systems. Um, um, about two years ago, uh, when I was AAAI president, this is the Association of, of AI Scientists, um, I ran a panel called Long-Term AI Futures, where we had a nice group meet, meet in the Silomar and talk about concerns about the march of, of machine intelligence. Um, uh, we looked at a broad set of issues, one of which was of, of directions in privacy and, uh, and um, incursions on people's uh, uh, sense for what they considered private information, um, both by companies and by uh, things like malware. So we said, one thing, one, we raised one concern I thought was of interest in our report, which was the possibility that new kinds of viruses and worms would arise that could actually go across your iPhone or Windows phone or Android phone, your, your Facebook account, your email account, um, your web surfing, um, and other data being sensed, and put together a very deep knowledge about you and figure out also how to take actions that might not be in accordance with your wishes. Uh, for example, draining your bank account over time or acting like you uh, in, in, in various kinds of, um, of, of interactions with others. Um, this was before we heard about Stuxnet, which we heard about last year, which is kind of a semi-smart system, not exactly using machine learning and intelligence yet, but there was a concern we raised that we want, want to start thinking now about the prospect that um, people with ill will could take advantage of these tools to do all sorts of things with data that's readily available from these sensors. So we probably just have uh, time for one more question. Uh, let's, what, what are you most optimistic about in, in the field of AI, whether solving real world problems or helping advance uh, the computer sciences? Uh, I guess I'm uh, optimistic about the kind of positive feedback loop of saying uh, as more data becomes available, uh, then we can start doing more with it, and as we do more with it, that creates more data, and uh, it looks like we're on the right trajectory that way. And in particular, I would like to resonate with Peter, Peter there, with applications to education, healthcare, um, the sciences, and our economy. I think we'll see some, some, uh, some that, that this kind of data to knowledge to action with a loop will really have implications for many, many aspects of our society. It's a great place to end. Uh, please join me in thanking our distinguished guest, Eric Computer. <laughs>